The Three Day Blow by Ernest Hemingway. Short Story Collection 100. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Winston Tharp. The Three Day Blow. The rain stopped as Nick turned into the road that went up through the orchard. The fruit had been picked, and the fall wind blew through the bare trees. Nick stopped and picked up a Wagner apple from beside the road, shiny in the brown grass from the rain. He put the apple in the pocket of his Mackinac coat. The road came out of the orchard onto the top of the hill. There was the cottage, the porch bare, smoke coming from the chimney and back was the garage, the chicken coop, and the second-growth timber like a hedge against the woods behind. The big trees swayed far over in the wind as he watched. It was the first of the autumn storms. As Nick crossed the open field above the orchard, the door of the cottage opened and Bill came out. He stood on the porch looking out. "'Well, Wimmage,' he said. "'Hey, Bill,' Nick said, coming up the steps. They stood together looking out across the country, down over the orchard, beyond the road, across the lower fields and the woods of the point to the lake. The wind was blowing straight down the lake. They could see the surf along Ten Mile Point. "'She's blowing,' Nick said. "'She'll blow like that for three days,' Bill said. "'Is your dad in?' Nick asked. "'No, he's out with a gun. Come on in.' Nick went inside the cottage. There was a big fire in the fireplace. The wind made it roar. Bill shut the door. Have a drink? he said. He went out to the kitchen and came back with two glasses and a pitcher of water. Nick reached the whiskey bottle from the shelf above the fireplace. All right, he said. Good, said Bill. They sat in front of the fire and drank the Irish whiskey and water. It's got a swell, smoky taste, Nick said, and looked at the fire through the glass. That's the peat, Bill said. You can't get peat into liquor, Nick said. That doesn't make any difference, Bill said. You ever seen any peat? Nick asked. No, said Bill. Neither have I, Nick said. His shoes, stretched out on the hearth, began to steam in front of the fire. "'Better take your shoes off,' Bill said. "'I've got any socks on.' "'Take them off and dry them, and I'll get you some,' Bill said. He went upstairs into the loft, and Nick heard him walking about overhead. Upstairs was open under the roof, and was where Bill and his father and he, Nick, sometimes slept. In back was the dressing room. They moved the cots back out of the rain and covered them with rubber blankets. Bill came down with a pair of heavy wool socks. "'It's getting too late to go around without socks,' he said. "'I hate to start them again,' Nick said. He pulled the socks on and slumped back in the chair, putting his feet up on the screen in front of the fire. "'You'll den on the screen,' Bill said. Nick swung his feet over to the side of the fireplace. "'Got anything to read?' he asked. "'Only the paper.' What did the cards do? Dropped a double header to the Giants. That ought to cinch it for them. It's a gift, Bill said. As long as McGaw can buy every good ball player in the league, there's nothing to it. He can't buy them all, Nick said. He buys all the ones he wants, Bill said. Or he makes them discontented so they have to trade them to him. Like Heine Zim, Nick agreed. That bonehead'll do him a lot of good, Bill stood up. He can hit, Nick offered. The heat from the fire was baking his legs. He's a sweet fielder, too, Bill said, but he loses ball games. Maybe that's what McGraw wants him for, Nick suggested. Maybe, Bill agreed. There's always more to it than we know about, Nick said. Of course, but we got pretty good dope for being so far away. Like how much better you can pick them if you don't see the horses, 
That's it. Bill reached down the whiskey bottle. His big hand went all the way around it. He poured the whiskey into the glass Nick held out. How much water? Just the same. He sat down on the floor beside Nick's chair. It's good when the fall storms come, isn't it? Nick said. It's swell. It's the best time of year, Nick said. Wouldn't it be hell to be in town, Bill said. I'd like to see the World Series, Nick said. Well, they're always in New York or Philadelphia now, Bill said. That doesn't do us any good. I wonder if the cards will ever win a pennant. Not in our lifetime, Bill said. Gee, they'd go crazy, Nick said. Do you remember when they got going that once before they had the train wreck? Boy, Nick said, remembering. Bill reached over to the table under the window for the book that lay there, face down, where he had put it when he went to the door. He held his glass in one hand and the book in the other, leaning back against Nick's chair. What are you reading? Richard Feverell. I couldn't get into it. It's all right, Bill said. It ain't a bad book, Wimmage. What else have you got I haven't read? Nick asked. Did you read The Forest Lovers? Yep. That's the one where they go to bed every night with a naked sword between them. That's a good book, Wemmage. It's a swell book. What I could never understand was what good the sword would do. It would have to stay edge up all the time, because if it went over flat, you could roll right over it and it wouldn't make any trouble. It's a symbol, Bill said. Sure, said Nick. But it isn't practical. Did you ever read Fortitude? It's fine, Nick said. That's a real book. That's where his old man is after him all the time. Have you got any more by Walpole? The Dark Forest, Bill said. It's about Russia. What does he know about Russia? Nick asked. I don't know. You can't ever tell about those guys. Maybe he was there when he was a boy. He's got a lot of dope on it. I'd like to meet him, Nick said. I'd like to meet Chesterton, Bill said. I wish he was here now, Nick said. We'd take him fishing to the void tomorrow. I wonder if he'd like to go fishing, Bill said. Sure, said Nick. He must be about the best guy there is. Do you remember the flying in? If an angel out of heaven gives you something else to drink, thank him for his kind intentions... Go and pour him down the sink. That's right, said Nick. I guess he's a better guy than Walpole. Oh, he's a better guy, all right, Bill said. But Walpole's a better writer. I don't know, Nick said. Chesterton's a classic. Walpole's a classic, too, Bill insisted. I wish we had them both here, Nick said. We'd take them both fishing to the void tomorrow. Let's get drunk, Bill said. All right, Nick agreed. My old man won't care, Bill said. Are you sure, said Nick. I know it, Bill said. I'm a little drunk now, Nick said. You aren't drunk, Bill said. He got up from the floor and reached for the whiskey bottle. Nick held out his glass, his eyes fixed on it while Bill poured. Bill poured the glass half full of whiskey. Put in your own water, he said. There's just one more shot. Got any more? Nick asked. There's plenty more, but Dad only likes me to drink what's open. Sure, said Nick. He says opening bottles is what makes drunkards, Bill explained. Well, that's right, said Nick. He was impressed. He had never thought of that before. He had always thought that it was solitary drinking that made drunkards. "'How is your dad?' he asked respectfully. "'He's all right,' Bill said. "'He gets a little wild sometimes.' "'He's a swell guy,' Nick said. He poured water into his glass out of the pitcher. It mixed slowly with the whiskey. There was more whiskey than water. "'You bet your life he is,' Bill said. 
"'My old man's all right,' Nick said. "'You're damn right he is,' said Bill. "'He claims he's never taken a drink in his life,' Nick said, as though announcing a scientific fact. "'Well, he's a doctor. My old man's a painter. That's different.' "'He's missed a lot,' Nick said sadly. "'You can't tell,' Bill said. "'Everything's got its compensations.' He says he's missed a lot himself, Nick confessed. Well, Dad's had a tough time, Bill said. It all evens up, Nick said. They sat looking into the fire and thinking of this profound truth. I'll get a chunk from the back porch, Nick said. He had noticed while looking into the fire that the fire was dying down. Also, he wanted to show that he could hold his liquor and be practical. Even if his father had never touched a drop, Bill was not going to get him drunk before he himself was drunk. "'Bring one of the big beach chunks,' Bill said. He was also being consciously practical. Nick came in with a log through the kitchen and in passing knocked a pan off the kitchen table. He laid the log down and picked up the pan. It had contained dried apricots soaking in water. He carefully picked up all the apricots off the floor, some of them had gone under the stove, and put them back in the pan. He dipped some more water onto them from the pail by the table. He felt quite proud of himself. He had been thoroughly practical. He came in carrying the log, and Bill got up from the chair and helped him put it on the fire. That's a swell log, Nick said. I've been saving it for the bad weather, Bill said. A log like that will burn all night. There'll be coals left to start the fire in the morning, Nick said. That's right, Bill agreed. They were conducting the conversation on a high plane. Let's have another drink, Nick said. I think there's another bottle open in the locker, Bill said. He kneeled down in the corner in front of the locker and brought out a square-faced bottle. "'It's scotch,' he said. "'I'll get some more water,' Nick said. He went out into the kitchen again. He filled the pitcher with a dipper with cold spring water from the pail. On his way back to the living room, he passed a mirror in the dining room and looked in it. His face looked strange. He smiled at the face in the mirror, and it grinned back at him. He winked at it and went on. It was not his face— but it didn't make any difference. Bill had poured out the drinks. That's an awfully big shot, Nick said. Not for us, Wemmage, Bill said. What'll we drink to? Nick asked, holding up the glass. Let's drink to fishing, Bill said. All right, Nick said. Gentlemen, I give you fishing. All fishing, Bill said. Everywhere. Fishing, Nick said. That's what we drink, too. It's better than baseball, Bill said. There isn't any comparison, said Nick. How did we ever get talking about baseball? It was a mistake, Bill said. Baseball is a game for louts. They drank all that was in their glasses. Now let's drink to Chesterton. And Walpole, Nick interposed. Nick poured out the liquor. Bill poured in the water. They looked at each other. They felt very fine. Gentlemen, Bill said, I give you Chesterton and Walpole. Exactly, gentlemen, Nick said. They drank. Bill filled up the glasses. They sat down in the big chairs in front of the fire. You were very wise, Wemmich. Bill said. What do you mean? asked Nick. To bust off that Marge business, Bill said. I guess so, said Wemmage. It was the only thing to do. If you hadn't, by now you'd be back home, working, trying to get enough money to get married. Nick said nothing. Once a man's married, he's absolutely bitched. Bill went on. He hasn't got anything more. Nothing. 
Not a damn thing. He's done for. You've seen the guys that get married. Nick said nothing. You can tell them, Bill said. They get that sort of fat, married look. They're done for. Sure, said Nick. It was probably bad busting it off, Bill said. But you always fall for somebody else, and then it's all right. Fall for them, but don't let them ruin you. Yes, said Nick. If you'd have married her, you would have had to marry the whole family. Remember her mother and that guy she married? The fat one? Nick nodded. Imagine having them around the house all the time and going to Sunday dinners at their house, and having them over to dinner, and her telling Marge all the time what to do and how to act. Nick sat quiet. You came out of a damned well, Bill said. Now she can marry somebody of her own sort, and settle down and be happy. You can't mix oil and water, and you can't mix that sort of thing any more than if I'd marry Ida that works for Stratton's. She'd probably like it, too. Nick said nothing. The liquor had all died out of him and left him alone. Bill wasn't there. He wasn't sitting in front of the fire or going fishing tomorrow with Bill and his dad or anything. He wasn't drunk. It was all gone. All he knew was that he had once had Marjorie and that he had lost her. She was gone and he had sent her away. That was all that mattered. He might never see her again. Probably he never would. It was all gone, finished. Let's have another drink, Nick said. Bill poured it out. Nick splashed in a little water. If you'd gone on that way, we wouldn't be here now, Bill said. That was true. His original plan had been to go down home and get a job. Then he had planned to stay in Charlevoix all winter so he could be near Marge. Now he did not know what he was going to do. Probably we wouldn't even be going fishing tomorrow, Bill said. You had the right dope, all right. I couldn't help it, Nick said. I know, that's the way it works out, Bill said. All of a sudden, everything was over, Nick said. I don't know why it was. I couldn't help it. Just like when the three-day blows come now and rip all the leaves off the trees. Well, it's over. That's the point, Bill said. It was my fault, Nick said. It doesn't make any difference whose fault it was, Bill said. No, I suppose not. Nick said. The big thing was that Marjorie was gone and that probably he would never see her again. He had talked to her about how they would go to Italy together and the fun they would have, places they would be together. It was all gone now, something gone out of him. So long as it's over, that's all that matters, Bill said. I tell you, Wemmage, I was worried while it was going on. You played it right. I understand her mother is sore as hell. She told a lot of people you were engaged. We weren't engaged, Nick said. It was all around that you were. I can't help it, Nick said. We weren't. Weren't you going to get married? Bill asked. Yes, but we weren't engaged, Nick said. What's the difference? Bill said judicially. I don't know. There's a difference. I don't see it, said Bill. All right, said Nick. Let's get drunk. All right, Bill said. Let's get really drunk. Let's get drunk and then go swimming, Nick said. He drank off his glass. I'm sorry as hell about her, but... What could I do, he said. You know what her mother was like. She was terrible, Bill said. All of a sudden, it was over, Nick said. I oughtn't to talk about it. You aren't, Bill said. I talked about it, and now I'm through. 
We won't ever speak about it again. You don't want to think about it. You might get back into it again. Nick had not thought about that. It had seemed so absolute. That was a thought. That made him feel better. Sure, he said. There's always that danger. He felt happy now. There was not anything that was irrevocable. He might go into town Saturday night. Today was Thursday. There's always a chance, he said. You'll have to watch yourself, Bill said. I'll watch myself, he said. He felt happy. Nothing was finished. Nothing was ever lost. He would go into town on Saturday. He felt lighter as he had felt before Bill started to talk about it. There was always a way out. Let's take the guns and go down to the point and look for your dad, Nick said. All right. Bill took down the two shotguns from the rack on the wall. He opened a box of shells. Nick put on his Mackinac coat and his shoes. His shoes were stiff from the drying. He was still quite drunk, but his head was clear. How do you feel? Nick asked. Swell. I've just got a good edge on. Bill was buttoning up his sweater. There's no use getting drunk. No, we ought to get outdoors. They stepped out the door. The wind was blowing a gale. The birds will lie right down on the grass with this, Nick said. They struck down toward the orchard. I saw a woodcock this morning, Bill said. Maybe we'll jump him, Nick said. You can't shoot in this wind, Bill said. Outside now, the Marge business was no longer so tragic. It was not even very important. The wind blew everything like that away. It's coming right off the big lake, Nick said. Against the wind, they heard the thud of a shotgun. That's Dad, Bill said. He's down in the swamp. Let's cut down that way, Nick said. Let's cut down across the lower meadow and see if we jump anything, Bill said. All right, Nick said. None of it was important now. The wind blew it out of his head. Still, he could always go into town Saturday night. It was a good thing to have in reserve. End of the three-day blow. A Walk in a Workhouse by Charles Dickens, 1812 to 1870. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. On a certain Sunday, I formed one of the congregation assembled in the chapel of a large metropolitan workhouse. With the exception of the clergyman and clerk, and a very few officials, there were none but paupers present. The children sat in the galleries, the women in the body of the chapel, and in one of the side aisles, the men in the remaining aisle. The service was decorously performed, though the sermon might have been much better adapted to the comprehension and to the circumstances of the hearers. The usual supplications were offered, with more than the usual significancy in such a place, for the fatherless children and widows, for all sick persons and young children, for all that were desolate and oppressed, for the comforting and helping of the weak-hearted, for the raising up of them that had fallen, for all that were in danger, necessity and tribulation. The prayers of the congregation were desired for several persons in the various wards dangerously ill, and others who were recovering returned their thanks to heaven. Among the congregation were some evil-looking young women the beetle-browed young men, but not many, perhaps that kind of characters kept away. Generally, the faces, 
those of the children accepted, were depressed and subdued, and wanted colour. Aged people were there in every variety, mumbling, blear-eyed, spectacled, stupid, deaf, lame, vacantly winking in the gleams of sun that now and then crept in through the open doors from the paved yard, shading their listening ears or blinking eyes with their withered hands, poring over their books, leering at nothing, going to sleep, crouching and drooping in corners. There were weird old women, all skeletons within, all bonnet and cloak without, continually wiping their eyes with dirty dusters of pocket handkerchiefs, and there were ugly old crones, both male and female, with a ghastly kind of contentment upon them, which was not at all comforting to see. Upon the whole, it was a dragon, pauperism in a very weak and impotent condition, toothless, fangless, drawing his breath heavily enough, and hardly worth chaining up. When the service was over, I walked with the humane and conscientious gentleman whose duty it was to take that walk that Sunday morning through the little world of poverty enclosed within the workhouse walls. It was inhabited by a population of some 1,500 or 2,000 paupers, ranging from the infant newly born or not yet come into the pauper world to the old man dying on his bed. In a room opening from a squalid yard where a number of listless women were lounging to and fro trying to get warm in the ineffectual sunshine of the tardy May morning, in the itch ward, not to compromise the truth, a woman such as Hogarth has often drawn, was hardly getting on her gown before a dusty fire. She was the nurse, or wardswoman, of that insalubrious department, herself a pauper, flabby, raw-boned, untidy, unpromising and coarse of aspect as need be. But on being spoken to about the patients whom she had in charge, she turned round, with her shabby gown half on, half off, and fell a-crying with all her might, not for show, not querulously, not in any mawkish sentiment, but in the deep grief and affliction of her heart, turning away her dishevelled head, sobbing most bitterly, wringing her hands, and letting fall abundance of great tears that choked her utterance. What was the matter with the nurse of the itch ward? Oh, the dropped child was dead. Oh, the child that was found in the street, and she had brought up ever since, had died an hour ago, and see where the little creature lay beneath this cloth. The dear, the pretty dear. The dropped child seemed too small and too poor a thing for death to be in earnest with. But death had taken it, and already its diminutive form was newly washed, composed, and stretched as if in sleep upon a box. I thought I heard a voice from heaven saying, It shall be well for thee, O nurse of the itch ward, when some less gentle pauper does those offices to the cold form, that such as the dropped child are the angels who behold my father's face. In another room, were several ugly old women crouching, witch-like, round a hearth, and chattering and nodding, after the manner of the monkeys. All well here, and enough to eat. A general chattering and chuckling, at last an answer from a volunteer. Oh, yes, gentlemen, bless you, gentlemen. Lord, bless the parish of St. So-and-so. It feed the hungry, sir, and give drink to the thirsty, and it warm them which is cold, so it do, and good luck to the parish of St. So-and-so, and thank ye, gentlemen.
Elsewhere a party of pauper nurses were at dinner. How do you get on? Oh, pretty well, sir. We works hard and we lives hard, like the sodgers. In another room, a kind of purgatory or place of transition, six or eight noisy mad women were gathered together under the superintendence of one sane attendant. Among them was a girl of two or three and twenty, very prettily dressed, of most respectable appearance and good manners, who had been brought in from the house where she had lived as domestic servant, having, I suppose, no friends, on account of being subject to epileptic fits and requiring to be removed under the influence of a very bad one. She was by no means of the same stuff or the same breeding or the same experience or in the same state of mind as those by whom she was surrounded. And she pathetically complained that the daily association and the nightly noise made her worse and was driving her mad, which was perfectly evident. The case was noted for inquiry and redress, but she said she had already been there for some weeks. If this girl had stolen her mistress's watch, I do not hesitate to say she would have been infinitely better off. We have come to this absurd, this dangerous, this monstrous pass, that the dishonest felon is, in respect of cleanliness, order, diet, and accommodation, better provided for and taken care of than the honest pauper. And this conveys no special imputation on the workhouse of the parish of St. So-and-so, where, on the contrary, I saw many things to commend. It was very agreeable, recollecting that most infamous and atrocious enormity committed at Tooting, an enormity which, a hundred years hence, will still be vividly remembered in the byways of English life, and which has done more to engender a gloomy discontent and suspicion among many thousands of the people than all the Chartist leaders could have done in all their lives, to find the pauper children in this workhouse looking robust and well and apparently the objects of very great care. In the infant school, a large light airy room at the top of the building, the little creatures, being at dinner and eating their potatoes heartily, were not cowed by the presence of strange visitors, but stretched out their small hands to be shaken with a very pleasant confidence. And it was comfortable to see two mangy pauper rocking horses rampant in a corner. In the girls' school, where the dinner was also in progress, everything bore a cheerful and healthy aspect. The meal was over. In the boys' school, by the time of our arrival there, and the room was not yet quite rearranged, but the boys were roaming unrestrained about a large and airy yard, as any other schoolboys might have done. Some of them had been drawing large ships upon the schoolroom wall, and if they had a mast with shrouds and stays set up for practice, as they have in the Middlesex House of Correction, it would be so much better. At present, if a boy should feel a strong impulse upon him to learn the art of going aloft, he could only gratify it, I presume, as the men and women paupers gratify their aspirations after better board and lodging, by smashing as many workhouse windows as possible and being promoted to prison. In one place, the new gate of the workhouse, a company of boys and youths were locked up in a yard alone, their day-room being a kind of kennel where the casual poor used formerly to be littered down at night. Divers of them had been there some long time. Are they never going away? was the natural inquiry. Most of them are crippled in some form or other, said the wardsman, and not fit for anything. They slunk about like dispirited wolves or hyenas and made a pounce at their food when it was served out, much as those animals do. The big-headed idiot 
shuffling his feet along the pavement in the sunlight outside was a more agreeable object every way groves of babies in arms groves of mothers and other sick women in bed groves of lunatics jungles of men in stone-paved downstairs day-rooms waiting for their dinners longer and longer groves of old people in upstairs infirmary wards wearing out life god knows how this was the scenery through which the walk lay for two hours in some of these latter chambers there were pictures stuck against the wall and a neat display of crockery and pewter on a kind of sideboard now and then it was a treat to see a plant or two in almost every ward there was a cat in all of these long walks of aged and infirm some old people were bedridden and had been for a long time some were sitting on their beds half naked some dying in their beds some out of bed and sitting at a table near the fire a sullen or lethargic indifference to what was asked a blunted sensibility to everything but warmth and food a moody absence of complaint as being of no use a dogged silence and resentful desire to be left alone again i thought were generally apparent on our walking into the midst of one of these dreary perspectives of old men nearly the following little dialogue took place the nurse not being immediately at hand all well here no answer an old man in a scotch cap sitting among the others on a form at the table eating out of a tin porringer pushes back his cap a little to look at us claps it down on his forehead again with the palm of his hand and goes on eating all well here repeated no answer another old man sitting on his bed paralytically peeling a boiled potato lifts his head and stares enough to eat no answer another old man in bed turns himself and coughs how are you today to the last old man that old man says nothing but another old man a tall old man of very good address speaking with perfect correctness comes forward from somewhere and volunteers an answer the reply almost always proceeds from a volunteer and not from the person looked at or spoken to we are very old sir in a mild distinct voice we can't expect to be well most of us are you comfortable i had no complaint to make sir with half a shake of his head a half shrug of his shoulders and a kind of apologetic smile enough to eat why sir i have but a poor appetite with the same air as before and yes i get through my allowance very easily but showing a porringer with a sunday dinner in it here is a portion of mutton and three potatoes you can't starve on that oh dear no sir with the same apologetic air not starve what do you want we have very little bread sir it's an exceedingly small quantity of bread the nurse who is now rubbing her hands at the questioner's elbow interferes with it ain't much rarely sir you see they've only six ounces a day and when they've took their breakfast there can only be a little left for the night sir another old man hitherto invisible rises out of his bedclothes as out of a grave and looks on you have tea at night the questioner is still addressing the well-spoken old man yes sir we have tea at night and you have what bread you can from the morning to eat with it yes sir if we can save any and you want more to eat with it yes sir with a very anxious face the questioner in the kindness of his heart appears a little discomposed and changes the subject what has become of the old man who used to lie in that bed in the corner the nurse doesn't remember what old man is referred to there has been such 
and many old men. The well-spoken old man is doubtful. The spectral old man, who has come to life in bed, says, Billy Stevens. Another old man who has previously had his head in the fireplace pipes out, Charlie Walters. Something like a feeble interest is awakened. I suppose Charlie Walters had conversation in him. He's dead, said the piping old man. Another old man, with one eye screwed up, hastily displaces the piping old man and says, Yes, Charlie Walters died in that bed, and, and, Billy Stevens, persisted the spectral old man. No, no, and Johnny Rogers died in that bed, and, and, they're both on him, dead. And Sam Boyer, this seems very extraordinary to him, he went out. With this he subsides, and all the old men, having had quite enough of it, subside, and the spectral old man goes into his grave again and takes the shade of Billy Stevens with him. As we turn to go out at the door, another previously invisible old man, a hoarse old man in a flannel gown, is standing there as if he had just come up through the floor. I beg your pardon, sir, could I take the liberty of saying a word? Yes, what is it? I am greatly better in my health, sir, but what I want to get me quite round, with his hand on his throat, is a little fresh air, sir. It has always done my complaint so much good, sir. The regular leave for going out comes round so seldom that if the gentleman next Friday would give me leave to go out walking now and then for only an hour or so, sir, who could wonder, looking through those weary vistas of bed and infirmity, that it would do him good to meet with some other scenes and assure himself that there was something else on earth? Who could help wondering why the old men lived on as they did, what grasp they had on life, what crumbs of interest or occupation they could pick up from its bare board, whether Charlie Waters had ever described to them the day when he kept company with some old pauper woman in the bud, or Billy Stevens ever told them of the time when he was a dweller in the far-off foreign land called home. The morsel of burnt child, lying in another room, so patiently, in bed, wrapped in lint, and looking steadfastly at us with his bright quiet eyes when we spoke to him kindly, looked as if the knowledge of these things and of all the tender things there are to think about might have been in his mind, as if he thought with us that there was a fellow feeling in the pauper nurses which appeared to make them more kind to their charges than the race of common nurses in the hospitals, as if he mused upon the future of some older children lying around him in the same place and thought it best, perhaps, all things considered, that he should die, as if he knew, without fear, of those many coffins, made and unmade, piled up in the store below, and of his unknown friend, the dropped child, calm upon the box lid covered with a cloth. But there was something wistful and appealing, too, in his tiny face, as if, in the midst of all the hard necessities and incongruities he pondered on, he pleaded in behalf of the helpless and the aged poor for a little more liberty and a little more bread. End of A Walk in a Workhouse by Charles Dickens Recording by Peter Tomlinson